Thank you so much for your kindness to Sandra and me over the last few weeks of celebrating uh, half a century of marriage, 46 of those years right here in this church. And it has been a, it's been a pleasure, it's been a privilege, it's been a battle, it's been a call. And uh, Sandra and I agree if it's over today, it's been worth every battle, every victory. God has been faithful to all of us. And the whole church said amen. amen. Father, I ask you now for preaching grace, for that thing that really can't be defined, called unction for that anointing that makes the Word of God real and clear, for that touch from heaven that makes preaching easy. I thank you today that you're going to get glory for yourself. Thank you that you've already been glorified through the music, and now may the Word of the Lord be preeminent in our hearing today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And I'll just ask you to go ahead and be seated. Thank you. Before I preach to you this morning, I feel impelled, driven by the Holy Spirit, to say to someone who doesn't yet know Jesus, you've never been born again, you don't know what all of this is about, your life, is only going to get worse. Nothing improves. Without Jesus, nothing has meaning. Without Christ, there is no purpose for living. Don't wait a long time to find that out. Don't waste precious time experimenting with things that cannot satisfy. There is only one thing in this entire world that can make life worth living, and it is the giver of life, Jesus himself. I am not talking about belonging to a church or a religion. I am telling you that Jesus is real. He is a man. He's in heaven. His spirit is here. <clears throat> he died for you. And all you have to do is believe what I just told you. And in a split second, you can find out what he called abundant life. I came to give them life and life more abundantly. So I just thought I'd throw that in your lap before I preach to the church this morning. I'm going to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Will you all just bear with me today? I'm full and running over, and I, don't, I feel like I'm about to explode. <clears throat> so just bear with me. Let me just preach. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Timothy is, of course, the protege of Paul. Paul knew Timothy's family. Uh, Paul said to Timothy, I knew your, your mother and your grandmother, Lois and Eunice and I remember what great faith they had when I preached the gospel to them. And now that you are under my care and tutorship, I want you to know that you got a gift from heaven. When I laid my hands on you, God touched your life and gave you the gift of preaching. But I want you, go to verse 6 if you would, and we'll read together. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Stop just a moment. Stir it up. Stir it up. It can get settled. You can get complacent. Stir it up. Now, next verse. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, 
but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. So I want the church to hear me say very plainly today, it is time to seek the Lord. It's time to break up our fallow ground and seek the Lord. Timothy was under the greatest of the apostles and was exposed to the greatest of truths from Paul. But Paul said, that won't get you through it from day to day. You've got to stir up the gift. You've got to make sure you don't get used to it. For God has not, has not given us a spirit of fear. If you're afraid this morning, you need to stir up the gift. If the world's threats and taunts have you a little intimidated, if they've got you worried about what's going to happen to your children and your grandchildren, you better stir up the gift inside of you. But of power, if you feel weak, you need to stir up the gift. You feel like you can't carry on, stir up the gift. Of love, the power of love, if you feel like your love for Christ is not what it was and it's, it's waning a little bit right now, stir up the gift inside of you. He's given you a sound mind. If all of a sudden you feel crazy in your head, and you've let all, that, all those lies and that foolishness infiltrate your being and affect your thinking, it's time to stir up the gift. Remember who you are. You're not one of them. This is not your world. God has given you a gift, and that gift needs to be cherished and nurtured, but ever so often that gift needs to be stirred up. Have you coffee drinkers? Have you ever noticed that you, you just can't keep your coffee hot? I drink a cup every morning, and I, I try to drink it before it gets lukewarm. I don't want to guzzle it. I want to enjoy it, but I have to go ahead and drink it before it gets lukewarm. Have you ever noticed you have to keep putting ice in your iced tea? Have you noticed that? Go to a restaurant. May I have some more ice, please? For some reason, this ice is melting. I want ice in my tea. I want heat in my coffee. Why is that? Well, that's called the amb ambient temperature. It's called surroundings, and everything always adjusts to the surroundings. Things naturally conform to the atmosphere the surroundings. And that is exactly why Paul was telling Timothy that you can be heated one moment and aware of the gift of God and then suddenly the cares of this life and the pressures of living begin to draw you back and suddenly heat isn't hot and cold isn't cold anymore. Hot becomes warm and cold becomes cool because of the world that we live in. So we Christians can never afford to let the gift of God, the knowledge of salvation, the presence of the Holy Ghost ever become a thing granted, a thing taken for granted. There is a constant, effort to fire up our souls and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you remember in the third chapter of Revelation, the book of Laodicea, everybody knows this phrase. When Jesus said to them, I prefer you to be either cold or hot, he was saying, <coughs> be anything but lukewarm. Be anything but lazy and lethargic. Don't come to me half-hearted. Don't yawn in my face after all that I've done. Don't be conformed to this world. 
Don't let this world drag you down. Don't become what it is. Keep stoking the fires. Keep blowing the embers. Oh, it's work, ladies and gentlemen. It's work every day. You've got to start all over every day because the power, the pull of this present evil world will never go away until we're in the presence of Jesus. So there is this concentrated effort, this cognizance that if we don't get up every single morning and blow on the embers of our soul with prayer and the word of God, we are likely to cool down. We are likely to lose our fire and our fervor. And that's what Paul meant when he said, don't be conformed. Don't fit into this world, but be transformed. Let your mind be touched by the word of God, by the renewing of your mind. See, you've got to put this in your mind every day. You've got to put this in your heart every day. Most religions leave it up to the preacher once a week to keep you fed and stirred up. That's not my job just to get you through this week. My job is to stand here and with fire burning in my bones. Something I've gotten stirred up this week. I'm supposed to remind you time is running out. Jesus is coming soon. The devil is mad. He's doing everything he can to destroy, to kill and steal. But God is faithful and God is real. And there is a fire that can be stoked in your soul this very day. Okay, that was the seventh church in Revelation. What about the first one, Ephesus? You know that one too. You lost your first love. He didn't say you aren't going to church or paying your tithes or uh, you join the choir and you go to practice all the time. He's not talking about any of that. Not the stuff we do. He's talking about the heart with which we do it. I'm going to have to get a hold of myself this, this morning. It's the heart, the motive with which you do all that you do. My God. So I say to this choir, sway. Sing loud. Clap your hands and praise God. Cry. But don't ever come up in here without prayer. Don't ever let a solo or stand up here and Sing without having laid on your face. They can tell it when you don't. And I say to the congregation, shout amen. Say praise God. Stand up and clap your hands every so often. You better because this preacher is going to preach with fire in his belly. <laughs> let, me, let me get back to it. You've lost your first Love, not your first interest, not your first effort, your first love. And it scares me to this day when I hear what the Lord said to that church. Repent or I will remove your lampstand from its place. If you don't do what I call you to do, I will move you out of the way and somebody else will get to do it. Now, I want you to see something I haven't seen until last week. I don't know why I didn't, but I didn't. You see in the first chapter of Revelation, and it mentions those seven golden lampstands, those seven churches. Jesus is in the middle. And they're all on fire at that point. Jesus is in the middle of the fire. I don't know what it is about God, but when he sees his people in a fire, he just shows up. Ask Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. They were in a fire, and one like the Son of Man just showed up in it. In Revelation, the lampstands are on fire. They didn't have light bulbs back then. These weren't LEDs. 
this was fire. And where do you find Jesus in Revelation 1? Standing in the midst of churches that are on fire. All over the city today will be plenty of church services, but no fire. All over the city today, preachers will stand up and preach from their heads. They'll give speeches and even include a scripture or two, but they'll preach it from their heads, and guess where it will go? To their heads. And there won't be a bit of heart in it. Head preaching will not save anybody. Heart preaching will save everybody. When it comes out of the heart, something is touched by the Holy Spirit. The fire of God starts in the heart, not in the head. And if you want to know God, you'll never know him in your head. You got it. I, I yell. I'm sorry. You're visiting. I'm sorry. I just get that way. If you ever want to know God, you'll never know him in your head. You'll have to know him from your heart. Every time you read through Scripture, you see that wherever there's fire, there's God. How did he lead his people out of Egypt? Pillar of fire. I'm even thinking of old Jeremiah. He could have said a lot of things about what he felt, but he said it's like fire. Shut up in my bones. Oh, Lord, help me. Uh, Pentecostal fire. What, what appeared on the day of Pentecost? Cloven tongues like as fire. What did John say? I baptize you with water, but there's somebody coming after me. And he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And fire. I tell you, wherever Jesus is, there's going to be some fire. And if Jesus sees somebody stirring up the gift inside of them, Jesus is going to show up. And when I talk about fire and stirring up the gift and fervor, I think sometimes people misinterpret that to be uh, wild stuff, you know, unguided, unguarded activity. That, 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 that's not what fervor is. Fervor is sensing and feeling and desiring and yearning to please God. So there's a difference in painting the woodshed out back and painting a portrait of your mother. The woodshed out back can just take about any kind of paint. You just slap it on, get done with it. I don't know that anybody would take pains to look at the woodshed and say, oh, I need a little more here and a little more there. It doesn't take fervor to paint the woodshed here. But it does take fervor to meticulously, energetically, emotionally paint a picture of your mother. That's what the Bible is talking of. That's what I'm trying to get across to you. Not wild, crazy, uh, unbridled, energetic activity. but a yearning, burning, hot desire to know Jesus, to represent Jesus, to act like Jesus. And it's all on me right now, see, and you. He has already come to us, paid the perfect and ultimate price, gave it to us, went back to heaven and he sat down. Now, it is up to me to draw nigh to God. That's what James, the half-brother of Jesus, said. If you draw nigh to God, God will draw nigh to you. You take one step in his direction and he will run into yours. That's how hungry, how much, let me, say, let me finish that. That's how hungry our God is to have fellowship with us. 
Draw nigh to God. God will draw nigh to you. How do I do that, Lord? Well, cleanse your hands, first of all, of this world. If, if you've adjusted to this world, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. If you're unsettled and undecided, purify your heart. Get your mind on Jesus. You double-minded. Be afflicted. Mourn. Let your foolish laughter, let your worldly laughter, let your silliness in this world be taken away. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord will lift you up. Jesus said, after he addressed that seventh church in Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The scriptures don't say this, but an old saint said it like this one time. On that door, there's only one knob, and it's on your side. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. Oh, there is so much right here, and I don't have time to preach it all. This is the Lord of glory, Jesus, the risen Savior. Jesus, the creator of all things, who stands in the middle of the churches. Jesus, the Son of God. Standing, knocking at my door? Will you let me in? Do you hear my voice? And says, I'll make you a promise if you'll open the door. I'll come in and I'll dine with you. But then that next phrase has gotten me for years. And you with me. I thought, now Lord, why? Because everything in the Bible matters. Every word matters. I would have been fine if he said, if you'll open the door, I'll come in and dine with you. But he said, no, if you'll open the door, I'll come in and dine with you and you with me. Want me to preach it? In the days when this scripture was written, it was the custom of the Greeks and the Romans. They had three meals just like we do. But in that household, the Roman household, breakfast consisted of a, a, a piece of bread soaked in wine. So they would eat a piece of bread soaked in wine for breakfast and head on out to the marketplace or head on out to the fields to work. And then they carried with them a little pouch, and in that pouch they had uh, snacks and bits and pieces of stuff. And while they were signing contracts, carrying on business, following after sheep, doing all that they do, they'd snack. They wouldn't even stop. They'd snack while they were carrying on business. But at the end of the day, and it's totally different in the Greek. At the end of the day, when they came home, all business was done. That's the meal that was supposed to last way into the night, where those who enjoyed it would lie around and laugh and talk and eat and eat and eat and enjoy fellowship. You know what Jesus is saying? If any man opens the door, I will come in and Dine. He ain't talking about breakfast. He, he's not interested in a quick lunch while everybody's busy and you're just taking out a snack. He's saying when, all, when you get rid of all that, when you're done with all your business, just remember, I'm standing at your door knocking, and if you'll open, I'll come in and dine with you, but then you'll dine with me. In other words, I want to be with you, but I want you to want to be with me. I want your mind, your heart, your soul exclusively on me. I don't want it on anybody else. I don't want it on anything else. I want you and me to dine and have fellowship, deep, long fellowship into the wee hours of the morning. Be anything but half-hearted. Anything but complacent, sluggish, languid. As I was praying the other day, I don't know, you know, sometimes you pray things and you think, where did that come from? And I said, Lord, turn 
my yawning into yearning. In the places where I've gotten used to you, and this is all just habit, change it. Don't let me do anything just because it needs to be done for you. Let me do it because my heart thumps and bumps for you. You know, Jesus talked about salt one time. He said, you're the light of the world. He also said, you're the salt of the earth. Did he not? Then he said, but if the salt loses its flavor, another one says savor, another says saltiness, then it's good for nothing but to be thrown out and men walk on it. In other words, if you are not doing what you were created to do, if somehow you have lost the drive, the appeal, and you are not fulfilling my call, and listen, and you are not enjoying me, what good are you? What good is this? How many times have I told you, church? They're, you know, they make cars in Detroit and other places. Some cars are made for gasoline. Other cars are made for diesel. Don't you dare buy a diesel and to try to save money put gasoline in it. Does anybody know what will happen? Well, I know it's going to knock and ping and bump, and, but it's going to tear your engine up. Can I make this as plain as I know how? When you became a child of God, you were designed to run only on the Holy Spirit, the Word of the living God. And when you try to put this world and all of its accoutrements, and all of its stuff in your life, you're going to have nothing but pinging and knocking, and eventually it's going to tear you up. Lord, I don't know where I'm headed at this point right here. That is the reason there are so many frustrated Christians. I'm just frustrated. I'm bored. What's wrong, Lord? I'll tell you what's wrong. You're trying to put diesel in your engine. Or vice versa, as they say in Anson County. You can't do it. You have to get to the place that you realize you were designed to handle truth. Purity. God's Holy Spirit. And nothing else will satisfy you. But Satan's job is to get you to let the fire die down so that you have only small embers and coal. Satan's job is to get you so weary in well-doing. And Satan's job is to get you so entangled with the affairs of this life until you, you are a Christian, but you're subsisting on the world and you are one miserable human being. Wow. So when that happens, when we lose our saltiness, our yearning, our hunger, we lose our power. And then we get to that place that Paul talked about in the last days when he said, men would have a form of godliness, but no power. No, a form of godliness. <coughs> I want to say two things here. The other day, on vacation, I don't know why in the world I picked certain books of the Bible to study on vacation. I chose Judges. I could have just reveled in Philippians and just had a sweet time. <coughs> but I, <coughs> I found myself in Judges over about the eighth chapter. And old brother Gideon has caught him two rogue kings. Did I make myself clear there? He has captured two enemy kings. Somebody told Gideon, these are the two kings 
that killed some of our family. Gideon said, really? So he walked up to, one of them was Zalmunna, and I don't know the other one's name. And Gideon said, did you kill some people in my family? They said, we did. He said, what did they look like? One king said, they kind of look like you. They resemble a king. And he killed them. What a declaration. They resembled a king. There was something about them because of their relationship to Jehovah God. Even their enemies, even though they did not know that they belonged to Gideon, when they killed them, they said, there's something different about these people. They are kingly. They remind us of royalty. Brother and sister, that ought to be the testimony of every devil that comes into your life every day. Who do these people look like? What do they act like? Well, they look like sons and daughters of a king. And they resemble them in their actions as well. The world ought to see royalty in our eyes. They ought to see that when troubles come, instead of us panicking like they do, we say, there is a God in heaven who's on the throne. Somebody ought to say amen to that. (laughs) Instead of always yielding to every sinful temptation, uh, the devil ought to hear us say, I don't need that. I had it one time, made me sick, almost killed me, almost put me in jail, don't need it. Found Jesus. Jesus is all I need. All my hope is in Jesus. Just like a king's kid would say it, I got all I need in my dad. And when we live like that, there is a power. You can't explain it. You can't describe it. And a lot of times you can't even detect it. But Satan knows about it. You know what's funny to me? I don't mean, <laughs> I don't mean that kind of funny. I mean, it's just kind of funny, odd. You know what it is? The royal family over in England. Have you ever seen such a, a to-do about nothing? <laughs> now, if you're from England, I'm not. <laughs> so just love me anyway. Think about it. Who lives in palaces? Who has eight or nine palaces? Who pays to keep up that palace and feed these people? These people wear different wardrobes every day. They got thousands of honor guards around them all the time. A gold chariot with horses living better than people pulling them. King Charles just kind of, hello. (laughs) (laughs) Mummy's gone. I'm here. What does he do? He goes to ceremonies. He signs certificates. He stands around and he talks. Listen to this, church. But the royal family has not one whit of government power. They are figureheads. And the people put up with it because it's a memory of the past. All the queens and all the kings, this is who we are. But there's not one decision that the king can make to affect government. He is powerless. Parliament has power. The prime minister has power. And they kind of acquiesce to this guy, you know. But he has no power. And in my mind, you know how I am. I'm thinking, I wonder if Satan sees today's church like that. Opulent buildings. The finest technology in the best part of town. Theaters. Rich preachers, driving real fancy cars, 
congregation having to support the lifestyle of the preacher so he can stay on television, so he can sell his books and his CDs and his tapes. Some preacher with a big dream to have the biggest sanctuary in the county. And here sit the people who have to get up and go to work every day and they pay their tithes to fund somebody's dream. And when he gets up, it's a speech he's prepared to appeal to their heads. There's no power in it. No anointing, no friction, no conviction. There's not an altar call, I'll tell you that. Because everybody's saved anyway. I think that when the devil watches most churches in action, he goes, this is pretty good. This is pretty good. These people don't scare me one bit. They don't have a bit of authority. They're figureheads only. They're going to their buildings and they're doing all their churchy, fellowshipy stuff. They don't scare me one bit because they, they don't want to get in a prayer closet. Uh, they'd rather go to uh, a ball game than go to a prayer meeting. So I got nothing to worry about there. He's fine, but I'll tell you what. When he starts seeing saints realizing who they are in Christ, and then when he sees them saying, I want that fire to burn in me again. And he sees the saints getting down to business and getting in the prayer closet and going to the prayer meeting and opening up the Bible. And then the preacher walks to the pulpit and he's got a heart message. He's been in the presence of the Lord and he's got a word from God. And he tells the people, you are not of this world. This is not your home. You are indeed royalty because it's been declared in Revelation chapter 1. The risen Jesus said, I have made unto you to be kings and priests unto our God. See, we talk about the priesthood all the time. You know, we're, men are priests in their homes and we, we have access to the a throne room of God is priest, but we don't talk much about royalty. I came to tell somebody today, it's not just about being able to walk into the Holy of Holies, it's about having a throne beside his throne. You are indeed royalty. You were washed in his blood and declared righteous by faith. You are the child of the Most High God. You were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You're a royal priesthood. You're a strange people because God called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And the last, go ahead, be seated. And the last thing old Slewfoot wants me to tell you is this. Don't you forget what God said to you about who you are. Jesus said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the, all the, power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. Now then, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now then, thanks be to God who has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Hallelujah to God. Help me praise him, somebody. Hallelujah. Listen to this. He did not say if you resist the devil, he'll just back up. He did not say if you resist the devil, he'll stand nearby with his arms crossed. He said resist the devil and he will flee from you. That means if you operate in faith on the word of God, the devil can't do a thing to you. You are already a victor in Jesus Christ. And that's why I told the 830 service this morning, we've got to stop looking at our bad situations 
and trying to have faith in it. No, sir. We got to have faith first. And then when we see faith first, when we see Jesus only, everything else, God will bring to pass for his own name's sake. Can I get an amen on that? I'm going to do one more thing here. I just can't shut up this morning. Don't send me on a vacation and expect me to come back tired. There's a passage. Everybody knows in Matthew 16 when Jesus said, uh, I'll give unto you the keys of the kingdom and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And of course the critics say that was only for the apostles. That was only for Peter. Well, then go over two chapters to chapter 18. When Jesus said, if you got a problem in the church, let the church deal with it. He's not talking about Peter and the apostles only. He said the church. And he said, in the church, whatever you bind on earth will have already been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose in the church will have already been loosed in heaven. What does that mean? Jesus said, for where two or three get together in my name, I'm smack dab in the middle of it. In other words, when the church realizes who it is and we get together in his name, he who sits on the throne shows up in the church and then whatever we do down here is the same as doing it up there. And whatever's going on up there is going on down here. Now, somebody needs to praise God this morning. And with me, please. So, I say to the church, we ought to quit playing defense. We ought to stop looking at the situation through our eyes and look at everything through the eyes of Jesus. Quit playing defense. You look like a king. Now act like one. You are royalty. Enjoy your rights. What are my rights? You have the right to ask anything in his name and believe that whatsoever you say to him, when your heart is on fire, when your faith is ablaze, whatever you say to him, he hears it throughout the halls of heaven. And God goes to work down here on earth. Can't... Here's what I want to say. I would, I would invite you Every man who is hearing me today, it's going to be a little odd. Every man who's hearing me today, single, married, whatever, before the sun goes down, go somewhere and spend 30 minutes in quiet solitude before him. I would invite every woman, get away from whatever you got going on. Go somewhere and shh, be quiet. It's been a while since I've said it, so it may be time again. God showed me in Scripture that it's easier to work for God than to wait on God. And that's why most people would rather go to work make it happen, cause it to happen, than to go somewhere and wait patiently on the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint just by waiting. I didn't say memorizing scripture. I didn't even say reading scripture at this point. There comes a time when you've got to lay yourself before God. <clears throat> but pastor, what's going on in my head? And all, uh, same thing that's going on in my head. It's the devil trying to distract you. 
Same thing going on in my body. Same thing in yours. The devil's trying to distract you. But I take my body into the presence of the king. And I say, this is all I got. I bring to you me and everything wrong with me. Me and everything you've made right in me. Here I am, a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto you. This is the least thing I can do, Lord. You'll be amazed at what happens. And then I would challenge you, don't you ever again leave your home in the morning without eating breakfast. You see me? And don't you ever again in the morning have a conversation with anybody until you've had a conversation with him. If you do this, this preacher promises you in less than a week, you'll be amazed at the fire, at the gift that's been stirred up inside of you. It'll become greater and you want to do it more and more. You got to turn the television off. It's puke. It's trash. Turn it off. And be quiet. And be still. And see what the Lord would do. Isaiah said, No eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard of a God like this who acts, A-C-T-S, on behalf of those who wait on him. Just by waiting. You'll see an upheaval in your life if you'll learn the power of waiting. Oh, you've done a lot of working. I'm working for Jesus. But have you waited on Jesus? So this is my declaration to you. And I'm responsible to God for what I say in this pulpit. Your life will be transformed in a week. Even if you think you're at a uh, an apex of spirituality right now. You never get enough of Jesus. Hallelujah to God. In a week, you'll see a great transformation. A blaze will begin just by waiting on the Lord. Here's what I'd like to do. Everybody can't come. <clears throat> we have people in the other buildings out there. We have people watching us today. There's a congregation in South Georgia. I just want to say good morning to you precious people. And the believers all over the world. You join with us and do this. Make sure that today, Sunday the... What's, what's the date? The 25th. You said, today is my day that I start waiting on God patiently, feeding my soul first. And you'll see a transformation. As I said, everybody can't get down here, but if you would like to try to come down here and join me up and down these aisles and across the front, I'd like to sing a song with you. And if you can't come, you're still in on this. Don't worry about it. But I'll wait on you. says come a little closer just, just a little closer just, just a taste just one drag one draw one sip hey just one look and we do it so I'm telling you now in the name of Jesus just come a little closer just say to him I'd rather have you for all of you, you may be visiting today, and you were shocked that that young-looking girl up there and this young-looking guy had been married 50 years. <laughs> you said, no, oh, they're joking. They're too young. They look too young. Well, I'm not young. 
And so I have the experience to tell you, young people, I've been there. There is nothing in this world that can satisfy you. It will stab you in the back every time. It will leave you empty every time. You can't smoke it, drink it, shoot it, or sleep with it, or look at it, or anything else without it making you miserable somewhere down the road. You can't be satisfied without Jesus. Just help me, church, for a moment. Am I telling you the truth? Well, Pastor, when I make my first million dollars, and then what? Well, then you'll buy a car, then you'll move up to another house, then what? Well, then the kids will be old enough that you, they're going to cost you everything you've got. Then you've got to work harder and make more. Then what? Then what? Then what? Then what? Then what is you're going to die. And Jesus said, what would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lost his soul? You're already rich, filthy, stinking rich in Jesus Christ. Let's sing it, David. Go ahead. I love you, church. And I want us to go to heaven. I want us to disappear at the same time when the trumpet sounds. Anybody want to go? Now, I don't know when that's going to happen for me, but I, I wouldn't mind being up here in the pulpit and gone. I wouldn't mind being up in the prayer closet and just gone. Wouldn't that be an awesome thing? Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come and take your bride away. And who knows, according to Peter, we could hasten the day of the coming of the Lord by living as he taught us to live. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my amen. Love you. See you next time.